Today, we want to talk about nutrition, and we've made multiple videos in the past regarding nutrition. And most recently, we talked about the triage theory and the importance of nutrients in overall health, but also in longevity and health span, not just lifespan. Lifespan is how long you will live. Health span is how many years of health you will have in your lifespan. So how healthfully you will live before you uh, hit the disability part of your life, which hopefully isn't until the end and for a very short time. So uh, this, this video will be associated with those videos by the fact that we're looking at the importance of micronutrients in our diet and that there are um, 21 to 24, depending on who you talk to, um, micronutrients that are crucial and required on a daily basis for our physiology to function. And this paper is a 2024 paper looking at uh, creating a, an estimation of the global deficiency of 15 different micronutrients. So I said a moment ago, there's up to 24 required micronutrients. This paper looked at 15 of them. And this paper is the, what's groundbreaking about this paper is it looked at almost the entire world population um, to get an idea of how many micro, how many people are deficient in micronutrients, in various micronutrients of the 15 that they look at. And so um, they looked at data from 150, uh, from 31 different countries, and they use glo globally harmonized set of age-specific and sex-specific nutrient requirements and applied these to the global dietary database, which covers 185 countries. And they used all this data to estimate the prevalence of inadequate nutrient intakes for 99.3% of the global population. So let's see what they found. And we'll get there, but first we want to understand why it's important. Micronutrient deficiencies are among the most common forms of malnutrition globally, okay? Iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia, leading to impaired cognition and adverse pregnancy outcomes. Vitamin A deficiency is the leading cause of preventable blindness globally, affecting mostly children and pregnant women. Both vitamin A and zinc have a crucial role in immunity, especially for populations facing a high burden of infectious diseases. During the recent uh, global viral issue, what was everyone taking? Zinc, right? Because zinc has key antiviral benefits. Vitamin A also has key antiviral benefits, so much so that the World Health Organization recommends vitamin A for measles uh, in third world countries that don't have access to medications. And even if they did, there's not good uh, antivirals for measles, so you should take vitamin A anyway. Folate is crucial for early pregnancy to reduce the risk of stillbirths and for and neural tube defects. Neural tube defects are the neural tube becomes the nervous system. And so if you don't have enough folate early on, there could be nervous system issues in the in the baby. Iodine is essential for pregnant women and breastfeeding women because of its role in fetal and child cognitive development. So that's just a few examples of a couple micronutrients that are very important to human health. Deficiencies in these and others collectively contribute to a large burden of morbidity or disability and mortality or death worldwide. So the importance of this paper is that their findings show empirically that most of the global population has inadequate intake of at least one micronutrient, okay? So you say, oh, yeah, of course, people in Africa and, and, and parts of Asia and third world countries are going to have inadequacies. So do people in America. And we're going to see which, one, which ones are more common in uh, Western societies, the so-called first world countries, as opposed to third world countries. One important note here is that more than... Uh, more than 50% of children younger than age five are deficient in either iron, zinc, or vitamin A. And two and three women age 15 to 49 are deficient in either iron, zinc, or folate. Uh, I misspoke earlier. Sorry, it's 29 micronutrients are known to be essential, not 24. So 29. This paper looked at a little over half of them. It looked at 15. 
Although nutritional biomarkers provide the best indication of nutrient deficiencies, these deficiencies can be caused by many factors, including inadequate intake, but also infection or absorption issues. How? Well, it's pretty intuitive that if you don't eat enough, you could be deficient in it. Uh, it's also pretty intuitive that if you have digestive issues that don't allow you to absorb what you're eating, you could be deficient in it. But how could infectious disease make you deficient? Well, if you're chronically infected, then the micronutrients that are required to promote the immune defense against the infection are going to be used up, right? So for example, vitamin A is antiviral. If you have a persistent viral infection, your body's going to use your vitamin A to try and fight that. So your vitamin A level is going to drop. And if you're not replacing that appropriately, then eventually that could lead to inadequacy or deficiency. So again, we're never, we're never like all set in our levels of these things. It's are we optimal at a given time, right? We never stop eating until we're dead. So there's always going to be a level of you supply and demand. The body's going to use some. We need to eat to replenish what we use. And that's the journey we're on forever. Um, like I said, this, this data came from the Global Dietary Database, which looks at 185 countries uh, and more than 50 foods, beverages, and nutrients, providing the best available data to understand the amount of nutrients actually consumed by individuals. So let's jump to a graphic that's really neat here. So here is, and I'm going to make it small here for a second so you can see all of it, but this is a graphic in the paper uh, showing the estimated prevalence of intake inadequacies by country and nutrient, and this is for 2018 data. And you can see down here the scale goes from 0% inadequate intake all the way up to 100% inadequate intake. So blue would be the best level of the nutrient given, red would be... Uh, 100% inadequacy or 100% deficiency in that region. So now if we zoom in and we look at, let's start with iodine up here. So this world map here is showing us levels of iodine in the world population, or almost the world population, or in the world population. And in looking at the world population, you can see 5.1 billion people, or 68% of the world, is has inadequate intake of iodine. That's a lot of people. Well, why does that matter? Well, iodine is key for thyroid function and metabolism and brain health. So if we don't have enough iodine, you might have hypothyroidism. You might have... Uh, cognitive defects and brain development defects in, in babies. You might have um, chronic infection because iodine functions as an antiseptic and antimicrobial. There's all kinds of issues you could have. So, uh, and look where America falls in there. America's not doing great either. Okay, remember red would be the worst. Orange is on the spectrum down here of, you know, 75% inadequate intake, so 75% of the population in that area. Heading over here, you can see vitamin E. The entire world basically doesn't get enough vitamin E. A couple little countries over here do okay, but otherwise the whole world could do better in vitamin E with two-thirds of the world deficient. Calcium. All right. Our, our country's pretty solid in calcium, and one reason for that would would be uh, the, probably the marketing behind osteoporosis and osteopenia and the dairy lobby and things like that. Um, iron, 65% of the world has inadequate iron intake. Again, a lot of that is Africa and India, but we have to have enough iron for oxygen carrying and energy production. If you're lacking iron, you could have cognitive symptoms. You could be inflamed. Remember, we need iron to make all of our neurotransmitters. So if you don't have enough iron, you might have more anxiety. You might have more depression. You might have neurocognitive symptoms. As a group here, we'll take riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, folate, which is vitamin B9, and uh, vitamin B6 here. And we'll look at those together. 
And why not? Let's throw in vitamin B12 too. So the Bs, you can see that North America is pretty solid in our B intake. Um, so not a big issue unless you're in India, it looks like for most of them, and Russia if we're talking about folate. However, a lot of what Americans are getting is uh, our B vitamins that are added to food or food fortified in Bs. And those Bs are often the poor forms, especially folate as folic acid. That's the worst form of folate. Methylfolate is the best form. Folinic acid is a good one too. So making sure uh, your B vitamins that you are taking are the healthy, most bioavailable forms is best. So folate, you're looking for methylfolate or folinic acid. Riboflavin, you're looking for riboflavin 5-phosphate or R5P. Vitamin B6, you're looking for pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P. And vitamin B12, you're looking for hydroxycobalamin, methylcobalamin, or adenosylcobalamin. You do not want the cyanocobalamin, which is the most common one found in supplements from, say, Target, your grocery store, your GNCs, junk forms. If you're wondering how do you know if yours has those forms in it that I mentioned, look on the back of your bottle on the label and it'll say vitamin B6, but then in parentheses, it'll say, you know, pyridoxin, or it'll say pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P. You want the parentheses to say P5P for B6, for example. Vitamin C. Not many people are doing great with vitamin C in the world. Half the population is deficient. Um, we can do better. Vitamin C is key for collagen and connective tissue. It's key for the immune system. It's key antioxidant, all kinds of functions for us. Vitamin A, half the world is insufficient. All right, antiviral, immune boosting, skin health, vision health, anti-inflammatory, thyroid function, mucosal barriers, gut health, all kinds of benefits from vitamin A. Zinc, zinc, we're doing okay in America, it looks like. Um, again, zinc is key for immune system. It's key for bone health. It's key for genetic expression. Zinc plays a lot of roles for us. Selenium, we're crushing it with selenium in America. Selenium is a, a, a key antioxidant and needed for glutathione production. It's key for thyroid hormone conversion. It's a key antiviral. It has lots of roles in the body. Magnesium. I was surprised by the color they gave us here. So light green, you know, kind of the ol olivey green would be maybe 30% uh, inadequacy in the U.S., well, U.S.-specific data says up to 56% of the U.S. is deficient in magnesium. So I would I would say our numbers are probably not as good as that olive green color there, maybe, maybe closer to the orange edge. And again, magnesium is part of over 300 different enzyme reactions in the body from preventing anxiety to bone health to your best natural muscle relaxant to cardiovascular function, all kinds of benefits there. And we can finish out here with two more B vitamins. Thiamine is vitamin B1, and niacin is vitamin B3. And it looks like we're pretty solid with those in the U.S. Uh, niacin, comes B3 comes in many forms. Niacin is one that helps. Niacin helps lower cholesterol. Uh, if you're looking at it as uh, NAD, that's key for energy production and longevity, lots of research into NAD right now. B1 is needed for stomach acid production. So if you've got reflux or GERD, uh, if you don't have enough B1, your reflux or GERD might be due to insufficient stomach acid due to uh, a lack of B1 to help the enzymes produce that. So I thought this graphic was really interesting for uh, looking at nutrient inadequacies worldwide. If we go down here, we can think about things in the diet that might prom <clears throat> promote inadequate nutrient levels. And the first thing they list here is phytate or phytic acid in the diet. Phytate inhibits absorption of zinc and iron. Where do we get phytate from? That's from our plants. 
Okay, so those who have higher phytate intake might need higher zinc and iron intake because the phytate is preventing absorption of those. Phytates are um, what are called anti-nutrients. So basically plants can't run away from us. So when we're trying to eat them, they can't run away from us. So the way that they're going to get back at us is by stealing nutrients from us through their phytic acid. They're going to, or preventing us from getting nutrients by inhibiting the zinc and iron absorption. So, you know, if you're eating lots of plants and you're like, oh, there's, there's good zinc and iron in this. Well, no, the, the phytic acids in the plants are preventing the absorption of that. So you could still eat lots of spinach and still have low iron levels. That's why iron from red meat is a better source. All right, finishing up here. So globally, the prevalence of inadequate intake was consistently higher in females than for males in the same country and age group for iodine, B12, iron, and selenium. So when comparing men and women in the same country and at the same age, women were more deficient in iodine, B12, iron, and selenium. Men were more deficient in magnesium, B6, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin A, thiamine, and niacin. So the men look like they're more deficient overall and specifically more deficient in those vitamins than what we listed for the women. Globally, we found that more than 5 billion people do not consume enough of each of these three nutrients, iodine, vitamin E, calcium. More than 4 billion people do not consume enough of another four nutrients, iron, B2, folate, and vitamin C. Our analysis shows that the majority of the global population has inadequate micronutrient intake. So what can we do? Okay, what do we do about this? Because here's another graphic to look at uh, Oh, before we get there. Nutrient deficiencies can be strongly influenced by disease status, like we talked about earlier, infection, say, and other diseases that aren't infection-related. For example, type 2 diabetics are commonly low in magnesium. Uh, inflammation will leach nutrients from you. The microbiome, if your gut microbiome is unhealthy, we need good probiotic bacterial levels to produce B vitamins and vitamin K2 and, and uh, short chain fatty acids, things like that. And then other contextual factors or lifestyle factors. So again, diet is just one factor. Disease status, inflammation, gut health, et cetera, also influence stress are things that can deplete your nutrient levels. So what can we do about it? Okay, here's a different way to visualize the numbers. And these, these charts showed um, men and women, so females, males, broken down by country and age. So if we go, if we scroll down at the bottom, they have the ages across the bottom this way. And I just highlighted North America to show iodine was a big one where women were worse than men in North America. Vitamin E, they're about the same. Uh, magnesium, men were worse than women. And vitamin C, men were worse than women in North America. So again, what can we do if we're in a first world country and we're, we, we don't have a shortage of food? What can we do about this? Well, there's two considerations. One, just because we have no shortage of food doesn't mean that food is quality. So we have lots of food in America, but a lot of it is processed junk that wouldn't pass as food to hunter-gatherers or cavemen, right? It's it's man-made stuff or man-adulterated stuff. So if you're subsisting primarily on that, then that is nutrient-depleted, sugar-filled frankenfood. So that's going to drive deficiency. If you're what if you're eating all organic, non-GMO? Well, that's great, but even our because of our soil depletion issues, even non uh, excuse me, even organic non-GMO food is depleted. There's been various studies looking at an, an organic apple today compared to an organic apple 40 years ago. You know, to get the same nutrients of the organic apple from 40 years ago, you have to eat something crazy like, you know, 30 organic apples today to get the same nutrients. So essentially, it's impossible to get all the micronutrients we need at 
therapeutic levels from our diet. And so what we need to do is supplement with a healthy multivitamin, multimineral to make sure we're covering our bases with those things. We still need to eat the best and cleanest diet we can, but we also need to supplement or else we're going to have issues with one or more of these micronutrients. And if it goes on long enough, that can manifest as symptoms. And, um, you know, we can prevent that by taking a good quality multivitamin, multimineral. So I hope this was, was eye opening. Uh, it was for me looking at this, you know, 63% of the global population I, I typed in on here is, uh, is deficient in one or more, uh, micronutrients. And so it's easy to correct. And that's part of the point of these authors is to say, okay, with this information, we can take public health measures to improve the micronutrient intake of the populations targeted, you know? Yeah, you could, but it, that public health measure shouldn't go any further than saying, hey, take a quality multivitamin, multimineral, you know, let's, or let's promote um, sustainable farming and things like that to improve our soils and our food supply.